Christopher Hargadon, you're an Emmy nominee for Outstanding Fantasy or Sci-Fi Costumes for the Umbrella Academy, uh, which is about a family of, an often dysfunctional family of superheroes. Um, and in the second season, uh, they found themselves trapped in the 1960s. Uh, so you're nominated for the second episode of that season, the Frankel footage. Uh, the characters are, are starting to reunite and, and we're seeing so much more of their lives in the 1960s. Uh, what stood out to you uh, in that episode that you're especially proud of? Um, you know, I find it very difficult to choose one episode out of 10 or so, uh, because honestly, um, Every, every single episode in this particular series anyway uh, is something that I really loved about it. But the reason I chose this one um, was all of the characters to me are interesting. They're all very diverse and, and different, although they make an ensemble of this dysfunctional family. But I found the handler uh, to be really a costume designer's dream because uh, I was really allowed full reign um, as I, I really, really have rarely experienced it in the past, there was, I was allowed to do exactly what I wanted with her. And she's, you know, a, a time traveling, uh, psych psychopathic uh, fashionista. So um, combining efforts uh, and collaborating with Kate Walsh was a huge treat because she's very much into clothes. Uh, she loves fashion, she loves period fashion. Um, and she just, uh, she'll do anything for the costume to look right. I mean, she was always corseted. She she wanted to get the right silhouette. Um, and so that particular episode, in regards to this character, really showcased one of her outfits, um, you know, from her walking down the stairs up into the building, removing her coat, walking up the stairs, and then revealing, uh, you know, with a massive hat and everything. It's, it's so rare that we as costume designers get that opportunity to actually have every angle of a costume scene. And um, I thought it was really uh, a gift to me anyway, and, and to Kate as well. And of course, the way she played that character just uh, really blew it out of the water for me. Um, and you know, having sort of free reign to 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 be uh, expressive and bold with a character, uh, where do you get where, where do you start with the inspiration for Schluck? Uh, where does it come from? For each character, you know, it, it's very funny. I try. I love to mentor young people. I have a lot of young people on my on my crew now, and um, I was explaining to them the other day that. Uh, once you embark on a project, no matter what it is, uh, and, and the thing is, sometimes you'll think, oh, I'm not sure if I'm really interested in that. And then once you get into it and start thinking about it, researching it, looking at the sociological implications and the historical sort of evolution, um, everything is interesting. And uh, everything with clothing relating to what was going on in society is interesting. And so on any given project, I'm always kind of, amazed at how you become like a magnet. All of a sudden there are things that are entering into your orbit that you might not have normally noticed, uh, you know, three weeks prior to starting the project, but then they become hyper relevant. And uh, so, you know, obviously we have to start with character, their individual personalities, um, you know, things outwardly that are going to explain their inner life that we try to create through costumes. But um, but once this kind of magical magnetism starts happening, I find it brings it into another dimension. Um, does that sound too out there? <laughs> uh, not at all for, certainly not for Umbrella Academy. That sounds perfectly appropriate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it is based on a comic book, which is another visual medium. Uh, do you, do you draw any inspiration from those, or are you coming at this uh, like from a, a fresh perspective? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's it's the same when when I work on something biographical. I always want to make sure that I really um, respect and uh, and honor really the uh, the person or people that are represented. Well, in this case, it's it's a visual medium and. I honestly uh, hadn't heard of the Umbrella Academy before I was called about it, but as soon as I, um, you know, bought the graphic novels and looked at them, uh, just the incredibly amazing illustrations by Gabriel Ba and just 
the whole kind of wacky storytelling in Gerard Way, really, the combination of the two uh, really inspired me. And so I, I kept trying to come back. I mean, there were certain directives. Um, you know, things were different. Uh, yeah, Allison was an African American in the novels, and she she was cast uh, as an African American woman. So obviously there were differences, but there were certain things that I really wanted to respect visually that were in the novels. Um, you know, Luther obviously wasn't quite as uh, tiny headed and huge bodied. Uh, you know, he was pretty huge body, but um, not quite as exaggerated. But I definitely tried to always pull in certain aspects, Hargreaves, his coloration, all that type of thing. We're definitely inspired uh, as a starting point. And then as the series continued, things kind of evolved and, uh, you know, grew into different directions. But yeah, I mean, it was a really nice starting point to have those novels. And uh, moving from the first season, which had the characters in the present day, to the second season, which brought them back to the 1960s uh, and everything that entails stylistically, how different, uh, you know, sort of a process, a challenge was it to to work on season two? Uh, well, um, I can't really say that it was it was uh, it was just a very different show. It felt it felt like a, a whole new show. I was I was so grateful for it because I didn't know if we continued on the same timeline, how it would be. Um, and uh, and that's actually one good thing about great writing uh, in series is if, it, if it's really at that level, then from one season to the next, there's always some new thing that really uh, keeps your interest and uh, inspires you. So so it wasn't, I, I've done the 60s before and I, it's, uh, it's just a period that I really enjoy because there's a, a certain sort of freshness to it and really in, in a way of simplicity. Um, but there's an optimism to the way, the, just the colors and the, you know, the way people, the music, everything. So, so yeah, I was, I was really into it. And then I had this amazing uh, serendipity where um, there was a costume designer uh, in Dallas who was selling off all of his uh, 60s stock. So it took place in 1963 Dallas and this was 60s clothing from Dallas that he accumulated in that vicinity, you know, over, over decades. So uh, I had an amazing base to work with. Most of the lead characters, well, actually all of the lead characters were built because we always need 12 of everything. So, uh, so you know, but, but for the background, I felt that we were very fortunate. Um, yeah, I imagine especially uh, Luther, as you mentioned, uh, you know, with, with that sort of gorilla frame, uh, he's definitely not an off the rack body. So I would imagine that <laughs> that, that would require like what, what kind of uh, work went into his, his looks? Well, I mean, he has to have a, a muscle suit. Uh, Tom is incredibly fit and I think he worked out like Matt to the, before he started this part and then he was uh, a bit uh, dismayed when he realized he had to wear this hulking thing over top of his actual body. But, um, you know, we had a, a sculpture made in his likeness once he's got the suit on and, um, and we just built everything. Uh, Tom was very happy to, uh, to morph into blues. I had him in earth tones uh, in season one and then, uh, you know, he, he's a blue boy. So he was very happy when I moved into blues for him. Uh, and then you've got uh, Klaus, uh, who uh, is a very uh, flamboyant, eccentric, uh, uh, you know, uh, extravagant character. Uh, you mentioned having so much freedom with the handler. Like, was, was Klaus also a kind of fun, free, open character to, to work on? Oh my God. Yeah, no, he's, he's fantastic. I mean, the thing about, <laughs> thing about Robert Sheehan is that um, he, he actually looks good in women's clothing. He's, he's one of those kind of... Um, He's like a chameleon. He he's a tall, uh, you know, uh, he's lean, but um, you wouldn't think that he fit as a woman size eight. But you know, a lot of the things that are more eccentric or more uh, flamboyant, as you say, um, are manufactured for women. If you're if you're not building, so um, so I would say we do build a lot for him as well. But um, when we don't have to. Uh, that's where I go. I go to the women's stores. Um, I started off at the beginning trying to balance out, like, you know, masculine dressing, feminine dressing. But as the show evolved and he evolved as a character and he presented himself in this sort of uh, uh, the way he is as a, as a you know, very 
free flowing person. Um, that's what we ended up doing with him. But he, fittings with uh, Robert Sheehan are always um, a lot of fun. You laugh a lot and throw a lot of weird stuff together. Uh, and what was it like uh, creating the Swedes, uh, who uh, are, are these assassin characters who don't say much, but they uh, always are very distinctive when you see them visually? I really love the concept of the Swedes because they're supposed to come from this tiny fishing village. And um, I guess they, uh, they ended up sort of getting involved with the commission. So they're traveling all over the world doing nasty things. But they, um, they all had to be on sort of a very icy kind of blonde. One of them actually was in, in real life. He didn't have to have his hair or you know, wigging or hair dyeing or any of that type of thing. But um, what I really strove for with them was a lot of texture, a lot of, you know, a, sort of, um, sort of well-worn in clothes that, you know, looked like they'd probably inhabited them for years and years and a absolutely out of time. I mean, uh, they, they actually did a portrait of them with their mother in the village, uh, which was on somebody's desk somewhere. And um, they just looked like they could be from the turn of the 20th century or, or, or now or who knows, but, um, but yeah, and, and as individual characters, they were so, uh, so fun. Uh, I, I really was pleased that they were introduced. Well, I want to congratulate you for your Emmy nomination for uh, your work on the show. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you about it.